Hello and welcome to Nous, the podcast where we tackle the deepest questions about the mind. I'm your host, Ilan Goodman, and my guest in this episode is a charming neuroscientist with a stark message. Despite all its glittering achievements, neuroscience can't really explain much, at least not yet. His book is called The Idea of the Brain, and it zips through the centuries to tell the stories of the different metaphors and mechanisms we've employed as we've struggled to understand how brains work. But as well as taking us on an enjoyable ride through intellectual history, the book delivers a bracing argument. Despite all the hype, despite all the immense technical progress, the multi-million dollar research programs, neuroscience still can't provide detailed explanations and predictions for almost anything. And no, he's not talking about the mystery of consciousness or any such highfalutin stuff. He's talking about ostensibly simpler things, like maggot brains or the grinding motion in a lobster's stomach. Enjoy. Professor Matthew Cobb, welcome to Naus. Thank you very much. I wasn't sure if it was Naus or Nous, as in the French for <laughs> us, but uh, either way, I think it's good. I mean, I say Naus because I'm, I'm as in the sort of the English vernacular of, uh, you know, common sense or savvy. Um, but but it has it, it has a number of meanings. Um, I like to think it's, you know, re- resonates with all of them. It's good. Now, this book, you might describe this book as a kind of survey of how incredibly far we've come in our understanding of the brain. Um, but it's also quite a sharp critique of the limits of our current understanding um, and the need for proper explanatory theories of how the brain works. Was part of your motivation in writing the book to undercut the kind of hype that, that sometimes surrounds neuroscience? Um, no, not at all. I mean, when you write a book, you have to write an outline. And the outline that I wrote, I think, had very little to do with what I ended up writing. I mean, this wasn't, sometimes you do this because you think, I don't give a damn and I'm just going to write any old nonsense and then write the book I want to write. Now, it genuinely (laughs) wasn't that. So the book kind of developed itself. It turned into itself. And I, I remember having a conversation with the man who took over as my editor. I said to him, look, there's not really an explanation for what's going on in the brain. He said, you can't say that. You've got to have an idea. You've got to have an explanation. That's what the reader wants. And to have somebody say, well, we don't really know, isn't really much of a selling point. Um, and I said, well, but that's the way it is. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm a, an evolutionary neurobiologist, if you prefer. So what I actually am interested in is how uh, evolution and natural selection have shaped nervous systems to respond the way they do, in particular, the sensory system. And I study the sense of smell. And uh, I had a training as a psychologist, so I understand a lot about our ideas about the brain. And I was kind of surprised to discover that these areas of neuroscience that I hadn't paid a great deal of attention to for the last kind of 30 years, they had uh, at the same time made tremendous steps forward, but also were completely kind of isolated one from the other and didn't really try to get to grips with rooting their explanations in the kind of cellular level, modeling level understanding of what nervous systems are doing, which is what I do kind of professionally. So I ended up, I mean, repeatedly coming up against not a brick wall, but just a a kind of huge fog Mm. of lack of understanding, um, be it over whether memory is localized. It's one of the, you know, is memory, I mean, these arguments which have been going back for centuries kept on coming up. So the question of localization versus distribution. Uh, What exactly the brain does, or rather how it does it. So I think there's a general agreement about the brain interpreting the world. We've known for centuries, and in particular since the work of Helmholtz, that the brain is making hypotheses about what's going on. You can see this in particular in the visual system with your, your the blind spot, this part of your visual field where there is no input because there's no retinal cells, detector cells on your retina at that point. So there's a patch of the world that you can't see. And yet 
you don't have the impression of there being a, a little black spot in your world, although there is. <laughs> mm, mm. What you have the impression of is that you can see perfectly well. And that's because your brain just kind of blurs it out like in Photoshop and says, OK, well, mm. there's something there. I don't know what it is. And I'll take information from the, the bits around it and I'll pop it in there. And we end up with this hypothesis about what's out there. So that's an, a, an empirical observation we can make and we can, you know, as I said, Helmholtz just showed this in the 1860s, 1870s. But how it's actually happening, that is this big mystery. And one of the themes that uh, we have in understanding in, in, in the book is the fact that we have this complete mismatch between our overall understanding what the brain's doing and our, our grasp at a cellular level. And one of the great examples of this is the work of Eve Marder, who's this neurobiologist who, for the last 30 years or so, has been studying the lobster's stomach, which, as its name indicates, is not a brain. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so this bit of the lobster's stomach um, has about 30-odd neurons, and it produced, these 30 odd neurons producing a, a grinding motion. This is an example of what's called a central pattern generator, which have been long studied by neurobiologists. And they're generally in the peripheral part of some hapless insects or arthropods nervous system. And they produce rhythms or behavior, you know, they produce outputs. And how they do that remains a mystery. And this is, a, I found extraordinary that, you know, this is an area that I'd kind of forgotten about for, yeah. 40 years now and I, I go back and I read all the papers and I, well they still don't know what's going on. Eve, Eve Marder despite all her brilliance and all her collaborators is unable to say to predict what will happen if you remove one of those neurons or you alter its activity. So our understanding of the, the interactions between just 30 grotty motor neurons which aren't anything special uh, is that we can't predict how their interaction produces the rhythms we observe. And indeed, she's shown that uh, you can get the same structure can produce many different outputs and the same output rhythm can be produced by lots and lots of different structures. So when you're faced with that as a kind of an empirical reality, which is way removed from most ideas about most people's ideas about what we should be studying when we're studying the brain, you realise that the there is an immense difficulty facing us in trying to root our perceptions, our feelings in a set of cells. We have the wiring diagram, which is the great metaphor that people use. We know the, the neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, kind of slow hormonal-like uh, chemicals that change the activity of the system. All this is entirely understood. And yet, we can't predict how it will respond we can't produce a good model of it we can't produce a good model of it okay yeah so so that for you would be a good explanation is when you could produce a model of it um and you knew why damaging one neuron had a certain set of effects is is that is that what would would count as a good explanation yeah, yeah. i mean there's so this is a point where I don't know, some a psychologist would say, well, understand, that's not my sense of understanding. You know, that's not what I mean by understanding. So um, yeah, the, the book is, uh, or the approach in the book is dealing, is quite reductionist in that respect. But it's not, uh, it's not denying that there are high level processes and there's a whole set of explanations or discussions about the various ways that scientists have tried to deal with these uh, emergent properties, effectively things that seem to come out of complex neurosystems. Um, and obviously, the prob probably the most amazing one is consciousness, um, which isn't something I am actually particularly interested in. I had to write a whole damn chapter on it. <laughs> no, but do you know, do you know what, Medio? Uh, it's one I want to steer clear of because I've done too many episodes on consciousness now. Yeah. I've had enough. <laughs> yeah, well, I bet. I mean, so that tells you something. So the problem yeah. with consciousness, just to explain why I'm not interested in it, because people think that's a bit bonkers, um, is that it is the most... I mean, along with what the universe is made of, these are the two issues that science doesn't understand, right? Mm -hmm. What the universe is made of and how thought emerges from consciousness. These are the two massive problems. Now, philosophers have been worrying about this for, you know, millennia. And science has got some handle on it, but for me, it's not a doable problem. 
It's not a problem that I can solve or I can imagine being solved in the next century. So I'm quite prepared to just to park it on one side and make progress in other areas. And that part of the problem with, as I guess you found in doing these, these programs about consciousness, is that it ends up being about philosophy, which is great. And philosophers are very, very smart people, but they don't play by the same rules as scientists. <laughs> they're not trying to find out the same things and they want the whole thing to be explained. Otherwise it's not worth it. Whereas a scientist is quite happy to understand one particular bit of a problem, whatever it might be, knowing that the bigger issue remains to be resolved. The fact that we don't know what the universe is made of or how it came to be doesn't stop physicists, cosmologists and chemists and all those people from doing fantastic work. Similarly, the fact that we don't understand how consciousness emerges for me is well, it's mildly frustrating, um, but I don't expect it to be resolved in my lifetime. So I've kind of right. given up on it. I have to, I'm not sure I buy your characterization of philosophers entirely, but let's let's <laughs> let's not go down that road. Um, let's leave that. So uh, now, I mean, you start all the way back with Aristotle and Galen and all sorts. But c can we jump into the story around sort of early to mid 20th century? There were some sort of conceptual tools emerging, some discoveries emerging that made it look like maybe computers could be built a bit like brains, and then maybe maybe brains were just computers. And um, can can you can you tell us about some of the ideas that that came to fruition and how they fed into that kind of excitement? Yeah, I mean, so this is uh, this is really the, the the crucible of which not only modern neuroscience but an awful lot of modern science is formed. It's the moment around about the Second World War, where in particular the idea of information as this abstract concept emerges out of maths. I mean, it had been partly floating around way back to the 1920s, but it was essentially uh, conceptualized in interestingly different ways by, on the one hand, uh, Shannon, and on the other hand, by uh, Wiener in the middle of the war as they're trying to understand um, well, they're trying to build anti-aircraft guns. In fact, they've got a very practical uh, problem they're trying to solve. And at the same time, there were neuroscientists and people, what we would now call neuroscientists, people like McCulloch, um, trying to understand how the organization of the nervous system could be explained using logic. And this was something, again, that went back to the 1930s of people trying to understand uh, use logic to understand quite powerful things. This is clearly what, what Turing was doing. And McCulloch and Pitts, and Pitts was this astonishing human being. He never had a degree of any kind. He never had any formal qualifications. At the age of 15, he was sparring with the greats of uh, formal logic and coming up with critiques of their work, which they had to admit were actually valid. Wow. Um, and he ended up in a very complicated way, working with McCulloch. Uh, this is in uh, in Chicago and at the University of Illinois. And they are studying how the way that a nervous system is put together, they thought, could be explained or understood in logical terms. And effectively what they come up with is the idea of what we would now call logic gates of if and not those uh, operators which are used in logic they could see in the structure of the nervous system and McCulloch and Pitts published a very influential paper in 1943 um, which they think is called the imminent immanent logic of the nervous system and they show that effectively you can carry out computations with a nervous system that looks to us now like a computer diagram because it's got these various gates of if, not, and you can therefore calculate just like you can do a calculation with a computer. So, so can I can I just jump in just to check I've I've understood this correctly? It's, it, what what they saw is that you could build simple electrical electrical circuits that implemented simple logical functions like not or if or no. Uh, no. <laughs> now, stop it. What they thought, what, what McCulloch and Pitts thought was that that was what the nervous system was. The nervous system was that simple circuit. The idea of then implementing that comes later. So they are simply saying, look, this is how nervous systems seem to be connected. Now, the reality is they're not connected like that. But they said, OK, if we've got a cell and it's got two inputs, 
then that cell might only respond if both those inputs are active, in which case you've got an AND gate. You need this and this. Yeah, You need both inputs for it to then mm. send its message on. It might respond by a NOT. I want one input to be active and the other not to be active. So the nature of that cell with those different inputs would effectively form uh, a logic point, which you can describe in formal logic. And that's what Pitts was particularly good at doing. So they built this schema about how nervous systems could effectively carry out computations. Now, what was interesting was that this was read by John von Neumann, who was designing or trying to think about building digital computers. You have to remember that, uh, in particular, uh, the computers that Turing was working on were largely analog. And... Uh, von Neumann comes up with the project for building a, a digital computer and he uses as his argument to the American government, we should build this computer like nervous systems. So the computer at first was a brain. It was literally the, 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 the model that uh, von Neumann argues with his bosses, we should build this computer, it should look like this because that's how nervous systems work and look at the amazing things they can do. Now, it very soon became clear to everybody, and to be honest, neurophysiologists could have told them straight away that that's not how nervous systems work. I, I sent this article to a, a pal who's a, a modern big shot neurobiologist, and she said, I've never heard of this, and this is absolute rubbish because they don't work that way. Uh, so the article has been cited, McCulloch and Pitt's article has been cited about 8,000 times something. I mean, immense influence, but virtually entirely by either computer theorists or theoretical neurobiologists, practical biologists, know that it doesn't work that way and have kind of, not, have kind of ignored it. But the key thing what they were showing was that in principle, it was possible to conceive of the way that nervous systems worked in terms of logic and in terms of computations. And this is rather different from previous understandings, which were largely showing the way that they do work in reality, which is kind of analog. So, uh, for example, Edgar Adrian, uh, the pioneer, brilliant neurophysiologist, incredible man, won the Nobel Prize. Two of his protégés went on to one that win the Nobel Prize. Amazingly influential, influential man. What he showed in the 1920s is that neurons respond increase, with increased frequency the more you stimulate them. So in other words, rather than being digital and just being on-off, they're analog. They're, sh they're producing an, an analog response to the intensity uh, of the stimulation they're given. So this view of computation, of nervous systems as carrying out some kind of computation that you can, in principle, represent in terms of logic, was enormously influential. And there's this quick kind of loop in that computers were built to be like that. And then, although nervous systems don't function that way, we've all ended up for the last 70 years thinking, well, okay, that's the way nervous systems work because they're like computers. Um, what were the other kind of ideas that, that impinged upon this sense that brains might be computers? Well, it soon became apparent that you could actually program a computer to do some quite extraordinary things. So in the 1950s, um, people start to partly influenced by Turing's idea that in principle you can you know anything that is computable can be represented using his little machine using um, using logic um, people began to make models of brain processes of learning of perception using computers using computer programs so this kind of um, you get the whole development of artificial intelligence at the same time. It, it all very rapidly branches off into different uh, approaches. But the one that interests me are those scientists who are saying, well, OK, can we model the or copy the psychological or neurobiological processes that take place in, a, in an animal or a human using a computer program, say for perception? Can we get a... Uh, a computer program to be able to recognize letters or something like that. Um, and then gradually, uh, effectively, they could. I mean, it must be said that these were relatively primitive uh, programs and the letters uh, were about a meter high. You can see <laughs> there are pictures of these things, absolutely enormous. But I mean, the, you know, the, the technology was relatively primitive and yet they were able to uh, develop computer programs that could actually learn and would end up being able to recognize things that you hadn't trained it on. And that's the really interesting thing, which eventually, and 
through a whole complicated set of uh, you know historical intersections and all the rest of it, eventually gives rise to deep learning and all the incredibly exciting things we see today where uh, you know you get for example they they trained a um, on these deep learning programs, they just gave it a load of videos from uh, YouTube to watch. In fact, it wasn't videos, it, the machine can just see the stream of zeros and ones, and it's looking for patterns. And then after doing, looking at 10 million uh, screenshots from random YouTube videos, it ends up quite spontaneously recognizing cats. <laughs> so this, this program developed without being told to, it was simply said, hey, see what you can recognize in here, recognize repeated patterns, and it recognized repeated patterns, which in fact correspond to the face of a cat. So that's the kind of astonishing thing we've ended up with. But way back in the 50s, this was being done with relatively simple uh, models in computers. And then people were trying to uh, develop this in terms of coming up with models of how visual perception worked. And in particular, um, one of the things that was kind of the great uh, aha, gotcha argument when I was an undergraduate in the 1970s was this uh, satirical argument about the grandmother cell. So uh, the argument goes, OK, so you've got a, a hierarchical system. We can imagine a, a system in your brain, in your visual system that detects lines, vertical lines and horizontal lines. And this is what um, Hubel and Wiesel were able to demonstrate in the late 1950s, that we had bits in our brains that seem to detect edges and lines and dots and all. So the, the elements of an image were actually there in our nervous system. But then how to get put together? And you can imagine, okay, in the same way as the computer does, you build it up in a kind of hierarchical model and you, you end up identifying the thing you're looking at. But how do you do that? And the argument went, and this was a satirical joke that was circulated, um, but it got, the joke got forgotten. Um, the argument was, if you had one of these things, you'd need a, a cell to be able to recognize your grandmother, okay? But not just to recognize your grandmother, but your grandmother standing on a head, your grandmother playing a ukulele, the grandmother on a donkey. So for every conceivable image of your grandmother, you'd have to have a cell. Well, you can't do that. I mean, that's just not... So this was a, you know, a reductio ad absurdum argument that we all went, yeah, well, that sounds pretty good. So it clearly doesn't work that way. But, it, but it's, it, it's a difficult challenge, though, isn't it? Because, because there is progressively more sophisticated extraction of features in the well, visual system. Indeed. That is how and, it seems to work. Yeah, absolutely. And at the same time as I sat on my undergraduate benches nodding sagely at this uh, great witticism, you know, there were people saying, well, actually, <laughs> you know, yeah. if, you, if you put a silhouette of a monkey's hand in front of a monkey, you will find a particular cell that will fire. And now we got the most bizarre situation where about 10 years ago, they were preparing um, uh, patients for operations for epilepsy. This is often the way that we make these astonishing discoveries. And whilst you've got their head open, they very kindly say, yeah, you can poke about in there a bit. And so uh, these people were recording from single cells in the visual systems of these patients and then sh projecting various images. And they found bizarre things like, one patient, a single cell, responded only to um, Jennifer Aniston. Only, only for, to an image of Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston. But it wouldn't fire if Jennifer Aniston was with Brad Pitt. Huh? So it was very, very particular. Another cell and another patient only responded to Halle Berry. What? And another cell only responded to the um, the Sydney Opera House. And just to show it's not all rubbish, uh, in a, the brain of a, somebody who was an amateur mathematician, it only responded to one particular differential equation. Now, these are different cells, right? And the, the, the temptation is to say, oh, well, in fact, we do have grandmother cells. You know, I've got a grand cell from my grandmother sitting backwards on a horse playing ukulele. The reality is they were only recording from one cell. Mm. Yeah, that shows enormous precision. But we can be absolutely certain that when they were projecting those images, bazillions, well, large numbers of cells were also activated. And the perception of Jennifer Aniston or a differential equation is produced by overlapping networks mm. of activity. And they just happened to be recording from one of the cells that was interested, for whatever reason, in Jennifer Aniston. And you got a, a response to this. 
recently some researchers have kind of developed this and said, well, actually, what do these cells really care about? This happened last year. So what they did was, this was in monkeys, they, they're recording from a single electrode, from a single cell, and they project, basic, at first they project just a, a grey image, and the cell doesn't respond. So they randomly change it, and the cell responds a bit more. They iteratively build on that response and then change it again. And so you can tune the cell and find out what it really, really looks like, what it really, really is interested in, what it really gets excited mm. by. And the researchers published this, and it looks like a bad trip. The, the actual image that really got these cells, well, these cells had effectively told the researchers they really wanted to see. It was in the face detecting area uh, of these monkeys. And you can make out an eye and kind of a bit of a muzzle, but the rest is just this bizarre mixture of bits of body and random backgrounds stuck mm. together. Now, what's happening there is that all the other cells are combining with other different aspects to produce in the, I guess, in the monkey's brain, the perception of a face of another okay. monkey. Okay, but so it, what would you say about that? Is, is your thesis that we don't have the conceptual tools to really understand what's going on there? And that's, that's kind of your central argument of the book, is that we don't have a good theory. We've got all of this detailed single cell recording. We can understand broad patterns about, you know, how the visual system extracts more complex features at different levels. We can look at how populations of cells fire in response to certain kinds of visual stimuli, but we still can't say why. We can, we still can't give a kind of organizational principle underpinning that. Is, is that your argument? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, this, I mean, all this work is extraordinary and mind-boggling and fascinating and, you know, jaw-dropping when you re read it. But... How does it all come together? And that, I mean, I've given a very hand wavy, ex literally, because I'm waving my hands, hand wavy explanation of, of, of how it all comes together. But there's nothing much beyond that. And the various theoretical approaches that have been tried, in particular, the one that's most influential to me by David Marr, who uh, in the late 1970s developed uh, computational models of vision, they haven't come to fruition. We're still kind of stuck whether it's in visual perception or any other aspect of brain function, with not really understanding how the various bits that all this incredible technology and brilliance on the part of researchers have been able to reveal, how all these various bits fit together. Okay. C can we extend that logic and just um, talk about fMRI? So fMRI is one of the technologies that you talk about in the book. It was an incredible sort of astonishing development in the 90s. Uh, and it's arguably given us incredible insight. Um, can you just say a bit about what, what, what it has taught us and what the, you think the limitations are to, those, to, to that knowledge? Well, it depends, <laughs> depends on who you speak to. <laughs> so if you talk to fMRI researchers, they would give a different answer to the one I'm going to give. So I think that needs to, you know... Uh, so fMRI, this is what we see all the time in the newspapers or on our websites. This is the brain lighting up. So basically what it's saying is this particular part of the brain is being metabolically active when the patient or subject is looking at something, is thinking about something or, or whatever. And the kind of critique of this is, well, there's, it's many, many levels. So the first is, well, what's the resolution? In other words, how many neurons are there in the, a single pixel? Of one of these images and in 2008 Nikos Logothetis estimate gave an estimation of this now the t techniques improved a little bit but not by an order of magnitude since then and so in each one of those pixels there are um, around 5.5 million neurons up to 5.5 times 10 to the 10 synapses <laughs> two kilometers of dendrites, and that's the input side of a neuron, and 220 kilometers of the output side. It is astonishing, but but Matthew, I asked you to start with what has it told us? What have we learned from it? You, you you've launched straight into a critique, but okay, fair point. But, but it has given us some. It has given us some sense of like this bit of the brain has this function. No. Yes, ish. I would say so. What it tells us, perhaps in some cases, is where. Bits of the brain are more active than others when uh, stimulation takes place. And this helped to reveal, for example, 
the fact that there are areas of the brain which seem to be uh, involved in face processing. So the work I've described earlier on, the monkeys and on humans, that's partly uh, come out of the prediction from fMRI studies that there is some localization of function. But part of the story of neuroscience, and it's not just to do with fMRI, is that whenever you find a localization, it soon turns out to be a lot more distributed than you thought. So that's what it's indicated. But I, I have a couple of a couple of colleagues tweeted things just randomly as I was reading Twitter over the four years that this took this uh, took to write this, being quite rude about fMRI. One of them said, "Well, you know, whenever I go to an fMRI talk, I think I'm listening to a snake oil sort of salesman." <laughs> Um, you know, and somebody else said, well, it's just a bit crap. Uh, and these are scientists, the, the reason is these are scientists using, used to using very precise measures of cells or genes and the, the lack of resolution is the problem. That's one reason why I started about that. There's an absolutely fun, even bigger one. It doesn't tell you, never mind that bazillions of kilometers and all the rest of it. You can't tell whether an area is active or it's inhibitory. So some parts of the nervous system are really important because they tell us not to do things. They stop us from doing things. You can't tell that with fMRI. It's simply saying there's a lot of blood flow going on in this area. And there's a very, I mean, the, the harsh critique of fMRI takes the problems that are associated with um, uh, using computers to, to measure differential uh, levels of activity, which was highlighted in the famous dead salmon experiment where they shove a dead salmon in the which is done by fMRI researchers. It wasn't done by people who are hostile. It was mm, people who wanted mm. to improve the area. Um, they shove a dead salmon in the, an fMRI scanner. They show the dead salmon uh, various pictures, and they ask it what it thinks about these photographs. And whilst the salmon's thinking about it, which, of course, it isn't because it's dead and it's a salmon, uh, they notice that certain bits of its brain are lighting up, and they publish this satirical paper about this. Um, so, you know, that's the, the, the using that critique, you can end up saying, well, okay, even if all of it's true, what does it actually tell us about how the brain works? At best, it tells us that perhaps some parts of the brain are active when some things are happening mm -hmm. to our minds or to our processes. And the harsh response to that is, well, so what? Yeah, okay. Um, now, I, I understand, you know, I'm not, that isn't my view. And I don't think we're ending up with a, a kind of modern phrenology. This has been the, 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 again, the harsh critique of fMRI, that it's saying that certain bits of the brain have a sole function. Their only function is to do, you know, I don't know, look at a picture or recognize Belly Harry or Jennifer Aniston. That, that's not, I don't think, what it's telling us. Um, but I think what it is telling us is probably less than it looks like. I mean, it, it seems like we, we shouldn't expect too much. Um, and actually, just some information about rough localization could be useful in, in concert with other, you know, avenues of research, right? So, this this question of localization is just absolutely fascinating because we know there is some localization, right? There are certain bits of the brain that have certain functions, but it's just the closer you look, the more that sort of slightly slips out of out of grasp. So let's talk. There there is one area that you talk about, which is the the face recognition area, is the fusiform facial area, is it called? Yeah. Yeah. Now we that that does exist. There is a there is a little bit of the brain that you know lights up in an fMRI scanner when people recognise faces. There's even a neuropsychological uh, disorder which is fascinating called prosopagnosia, yep. where people have perfectly good vision, can recognise objects, they cannot recognise faces. Just astonishing. Um, so so there's really strong evidence that, that there is this bit of the brain that specialises in recognising, enabling us to recognise faces. So presumably it's that, you know, the, the visual information comes in and gets progressively analyzed into more complex features. And some bit is just focusing on features that are somehow uh, face related, presumably. How, how does that then slip out again? Like, how, wh wh where does the localization story end? Where do we stop moving all the way to grandmother cells? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. If I knew that, I'd be very rich. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I think the problem is that it depends on quite how fine a level you're looking at. My guess is those those uh, face detecting areas are not the only part. And you wouldn't because you wouldn't be able to tell. So this was something that people who've been looking at face detecting areas have shown that there are some parts you can't see on fMRI, but you can see with an electrode. 
So it's part just because there's an absence of response in an fMRI that a detect system. That doesn't mean to say there's nothing going on elsewhere. It means it's below the resolution of what you're dealing with. Um, so, for example, in the visual system, we know that the, clearly we've got part of our brain which processes the visual visual signals and all the rest of it. And the cat's visual system was one of the most intensively studied following, following from the work of, of Hubel and Wiesel. And yet we know that integrated into those visual signals are also auditory signals. So at the various earliest levels of processing, the cat is not only seeing some, looking for a, something visual, it's also putting in another sensory system, because clearly if it hears a rustle and sees a movement, it's going to jump. You can imagine very simply why you'd want to have, even at the earliest stages, a conditionality or an extra bit of information. Similarly, in the olfactory system, we now know that uh, the olfactory system, which has been hideously understudied compared to the visual system, has top-down input from other areas of the brain that are altering the activity of our, even of our earliest processing of smells. It's being nuanced by what we know, by what we remember, and perhaps by what we're perceiving with other sensory systems. So there's kind of a broad picture. Okay, this is basically where a lot of the heavy lifting is done, but you need to understand that this is an integrated system and there's input from other other networks, other sensory aspects, and we don't perceive simply vision, simply smell, uh, simply hearing. These things are actually all kind of intertwined, which can often explain strange illusions whereby you can alter uh, perception by manipulating one sensory modality and it affects another and so on. Okay, so let's, um, you, you talked at the beginning about how some scientists can get sniffy about or have been have been sniffy about certain kinds of theories in neuroscience or certain kinds of approaches as not really explaining, uh, particularly scientists who have been used to working with single cell recording or really detailed, really carefully controlled genetic manipulation. But you do also talk about the Human Brain Project. Now, the Human Brain Project is, yeah. in a sense, an attempt to do that. It's an attempt to understand the behavior of individual cells within enormous networks and develop a simulation of those. Let, let me just say something about the, the Human Brain Project so everyone knows what we're talking about. It's one of the most expensive schemes ever funded. Uh, it was a 10-year program started in 2013, uh, funded to the tune of 1 billion euros, it covers 150 research groups in 80 institutions. It'll train 5,000 PhD students. And, it, and one of its initial claims was that by 2020, it would be possible to produce cellular level simulations of the complete human brain. It is now 2020. How have they done? Uh, pretty badly. And I must be said, and the, in fact, the clue to what was going on here, and this was, this caused a massive row in the scientific community. I mean, there were open letters sent to nature and nasty comments. And, you know, many neuroscientists refused to be involved in it because they thought it was not quite a scam, but that it was not doing what it said it was doing. What they said is we can do this by 2020 if we have the computational technique. So they were reducing this actual problem, I mean, incredibly mind-boggling problem of first describing the nervous system, then working out what it's doing, to a problem of computation, which I think was a mistake, but it showed where their real interests lay, and that was in developing the computational tools and the hardware that would enable them to do this. Now, what they've actually done uh, so far is to model a tiny little part of the uh, cortex of a rat that is involved in detecting its whiskers movement. <laughs> and uh, this only involved the neurons. So you've got to remember that the brain is not just made up of neurons. There are lots of other cells. There are mm. in particular glial cells, these cells which are kind of nourish and interact. They alter the activity of neurons and they were not included in the model deliberately. So it's, you know, a really kind of very simplistic model of what the, the, the rat cortex does. And I mean, it basically... It didn't fall over, it didn't crash, the model kind of worked and did various things, but nobody, I don't think, was terribly impressed by it beyond the fact that it existed. Um, I don't know of any predictions that it was able to make that have then gone on to be verified experimentally. Um, 
I mean, I think it was a colossal waste of money, frankly. I mean, I've got colleagues who work on the computational side of it who love it because, you know, they've built lovely spiffy computers, but I don't think it's going to tell us anything about how the, the, the human brain works. And you know. Okay, I mean, so you, I mean, you, you talked earlier about the, the lobster stomach yeah. and the 30 neurons involved there, and we still can't predict what happens if we, you know, take one of those neurons out or if we give the system certain inputs. Did did they solve any of those sorts of problems? Do you think with the, with the? Um, not to my knowledge, no. So so that's that's the same. It's they built this. They have built a model, but partial model. A partial model. That's I guess that's the that's the crucial thing. So they can't really be sure how well it describes. Well, it seems to vaguely correspond to the. It shows the kind of resting activity and the the shifting between states that we'd expect. But you know those computer models I talked about in the nineteen fifties did that. And, you know, with, I don't know how many, they didn't even have kilobytes of memory. You know, they're really, really simple computer programs were able to show that you get the kind of alternating patterns of activity that we see in nervous systems, including in the lobster's stomach. So they got that out of it, which I guess is actually pretty impressive because it is so complicated. And some of the uh, their model was actually based on actual uh connectomic data so real microscopic data about how the neurons were connected the rest of it a bit like we do with our blind spot they kind of blurred and photoshopped in and said okay well we'll kind of assume that the rest of it works on along the same lines which may or may not be the case but despite i think one of the things you can say positive about it is that despite all these criticisms it didn't fall over it didn't crash and fail completely. So they've got something there. There's something going on. I don't think it's complete trash. Yeah, I'm just not sure how it's going to help us. So their their approach was, I guess, in essence, trying to reverse engineer, trying to figure out how how every neuron works, and and therefore sort of build a system from that to understand the behavior of the whole network. Yeah. Um, now, one bit I really enjoyed reading about is this study by uh, Eric Jonas and, and Conrad Paul Cording, which, which m may give us a clue as to why this, this task of reverse engineering uh, how the brain works m might, might not work out so well or might be so, so damn hard. Um, th and th what they did was, was quite brilliant. So they had this paper in 2017 called uh, Could a Neuroscientist Understand a Microprocessor? Brilliant question. So, uh, and they and they used this <laughs> very simple microchip that was that was used in the eighties to to power Atari and Apple and Nintendos. It's only got three and a half thousand transistors, right? I'm just I'm just reading this from my notes. It's got three and a half thousand yeah, transistors. I'm, I'm, I can't. You know what? I can't remember these things. No, off the well, top I, of my I, head. I just I, I loved reading <laughs> about this study. It was it's so clever. Um, so of course. The, the question was, if you allow neuroscientists to use the kind of techniques they use on brains to understand this microchip, can they do it? Uh, and it's so simple and you think brilliant. But three, three and a half thousand transistors versus, you know, 86 billion neurons in the human brain, something like that. Um, it should have been easy. And, and the, the, the even funnier thing is that they, they, they had the, um, the microchip sort of simulation run Donkey Kong and Space Invaders. And then, and then they did a bunch of stuff. They did a bunch of stuff similar to what neuroscientists might do in the way, in trying to understand the brain. Can you can you tell us about what they did and what happened? Yeah. So they the key thing, of course, is that uh, in the technical term, the processor has a ground truth. I mean, it, there is an answer to this. There might not be an answer to you know the brain because it's lots of different bits stuck together and it co-evolved and lots of reasons like that. But a computer chip is something that's designed by humans to do something very very specific. So there is an answer. Uh, and basically, they they deleted uh, some of the various components, deleted the, the 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 transistors. And for example, there there are ninety eight transistors, and if you removed each of them. Any, any one of them, it stopped Donkey Kong booting up, but it didn't have the same effect on Space Invaders or Pitfall. So there's clearly something about Donkey Kong that required the whole lot to be involved, but apparently an identical game didn't require that. Now, that doesn't mean to say there's a Donkey Kong transistor. It doesn't mean to say that there's a grandmother cell or this is required. It means the whole lot is required for Donkey Kong, and it's doing something at the beginning of its processing that requires the activity of all 98 transistors, which is more complicated, I guess, than Space Invaders, the way it's representing the images on the screen or whatever. And what's so brilliant about, I mean, I remember studying psychology as an undergraduate and, you know, being introduced to neuropsychology, 
and and the whole sort of rationale of that discipline is studying patterns of brain damage and the resulting cognitive deficit. So if if people have a stroke or if they have an accident and they damage a bit of the brain um, or or they have surgery for epilepsy, what what functions do they lose? And and then you try and sort of figure out sort of by looking backwards, well, what, what must that bit of the brain do? And, and what, this, what this study shows is even if you systematically damage one transistor at a time, you get these kind of results where 98 of them stopped Donkey Kong from loading, but they didn't stop the other games from loading. What do you conclude from that? <laughs> it's, it's, it's brilliant because you, you go, oh, shit. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe neuropsychology <laughs> is all nonsense. It's, it, I mean, I, I don't think it is, but, right. but, it, but, is, no. but it, it sort of raises that specter, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think what it's telling us is that we need to be very careful about our claims, which is one reason why my book contains very few, <laughs> uh, you know, because it is really, really complicated. And these are arguments, as I say, that have been rambling on for for years. When I was an undergraduate, uh, the argument, this is the main argument proposed by Richard Gregory, the great psychologist of illusions from Bristol University. And he used uh, analogies which made sense to, us, sense to us in those days, but are now gibberish to young people. Uh, like if you take a, a valve out of a television or a radio, he said, you know, if you've got a radio and you take one of these parts of it, so you can say transistor if you want, all of a sudden your radio starts producing feedback. And so you say, aha, right, this device here is the feedback suppressor. That's what it does. It <laughs> stops the system from howling and producing this horrible noise. Whereas, of course, what's really happened is you've now got a malfunctioning system that can't balance itself and it produces feedback. And he spent a lot of time trying to argue against this approach he had very little effect, it must be said, because it's not only neuropsychology, it's genetics, mm. which is one of the other areas that I study. I mean, an awful lot of genetics is based on, upon mutant study where you knock something out and you say, oh, look, this is what the animal does now. Therefore, that's what the, you know, this is a howl suppressor. <laughs> that's what this, this particular gene does. So it's the same logic. And what it misses out is that these systems are co-evolved and they are organismal. It's the whole organism together that produces it. And one of, one of the things about the, the Donkey Kong uh, processor is that if you think about it a bit, okay, let's say if they had worked out how it worked, they wouldn't have been able to tell it requires a human to operate it. Because the whole point of that system is not just to run a game, it's to play the game, it's to respond, it's to do various things. And you can't work that out. You'd have to actually observe somebody playing Donkey Kong or Space Invaders, and then you'd get an idea. So the, 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 the problem with it went even further than they went in their paper. In fact, you needed to fully understand that. You need to integrate it not only into the machine with the screen and all the rest of it, but with a human operative to try and then make it work. And that's the brain is in a body. The brain is the body and the body is floating about in the outside world and interacting all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I hadn't thought of that study in that way, but I see what you mean, that you can't understand why the microchip is built in a certain way without looking at someone interacting with Donkey Kong or Space Invaders because it's that's what it's built to enable or is it built to enable some sort of software that a person interacts with. Yeah, you wouldn't necessarily know that there was interaction going on. That was essential if you just watched it. So if you imagine that this is a Martian spaceship that's fallen to ground and the Martians mm. have got their games with them because uh, they're going to get bored on their space travel and we pick out this chip and we're not going to work out that some, you know, squiggly green octopus has been pressing different different keys to try and make Donkey Kong jump over whatever it jumps off. I'm too old to have played Donkey Kong. I did play Space but, Invaders. Uh, but the sort of the takeaway from that that piece of research just sort of seems to be, um, you know, systems like microchips and even more so like the brain are complex, nonlinear, and reverse engineering them is going to be really, really hard. Is, is that fair? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I think that's um, fair. So, yeah. so no wonder doing neuroscience is really hard. Yeah, and I think the only way forward really is to study simple, small problems. I mean, my I'm as you already gather from my remarks about philosophers, I tend to be allergic to grand schemes and grand theories, especially when they're heavily mathematical, because I can't understand them <laughs> and I find that frustrating. So I I tend to be happier with things I can actually grasp and understand, which is at the moment going to be relatively simple systems. So I think that you know. I mean, it's, it's all good. Don't get me wrong. I don't think anybody should stop working in any of the areas, including the people doing the human brain 
stuff. I mean, that's all, it's it's all going to contribute. And they could be right. You know, I could be wrong. I'm not, I don't claim to have divine knowledge in this respect, unfortunately. Um, it's just that when you look at it all and you integrate this stuff with, I don't know, say stuff on neurotransmitters and mental health, and you think of all the other aspects that people are interested in about the brain, it, it just doesn't fit together. There's no coherent understanding of how this thing works. And then in terms of health, how it what we can do when it starts going wrong. We haven't got the faintest idea. So th there's one more example I wanted to, to work through with you. This is the example of being able to implant electrodes into people who are paralyzed yeah. and use and uh, give them control over like robotic arms or robotic hands or stuff. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's been a sort of astonishing levels of achievement there. So there's a group, uh, John Donahue's group at Brown University, and they put in electrodes into tetraplegic page, patients, so all four limbs paralyzed. And the, those patients can learn to coordinate a robotic arm to feed themselves, to move things around. And when I was trying to, you know, think about the 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 level of understanding you must have to be able to build something like that i started wondering well mustn't they have the kind of theory you're looking for so so what they're doing is and i, I might be wrong about this so let me let me just sort of fire this at you and see what yeah. you think that, that you, they've got to build a system that can interpret patterns of neural activity translate that into the movement of an arm or a hand or whatever it is now you've got to have an understanding of what certain patterns of neural activation mean in order to be able to do that right so is, isn't that sort of in effect isn't that the kind of theory that you want that, that you you seem to say is missing well it, again it's it it's not what it looks like okay so what they are not doing is putting electrodes into the very cells that before their accidents these patients would have used to move their arms up and down mm. okay it's not directly uh, kind of taking that output from their desire to move their arm and then turning that into an electrical activity, which is moving an electric arm. That That is exactly what you, you have described. Mm. And that's what we don't have. Okay. We don't have that level of precision. And that's why, as you said, the patients have to learn to use it. So these are areas of activity in their brain that, and it's not just the patients that are learning, it's the computers. The computers are, it's a, it's a feedback loop between the patient and the computer as their changing cerebral activity is translated into the movement of the arm. They learn how to do it and the computer gets better at interpreting that particular signal and recognizing, okay, this is what it means for, you know, they, that particular pattern of activity I'm going to interpret in this way. And you can see this in, a completely non-invasive approach whereby um, a Japanese group were putting headsets onto people. So this is on the outside. So they're measuring skull activity and the activity, the muscles in the skull. And people were then able to control a third arm, which would uh, move around and hold a ball, move a ball uh, on, a, on a tray and so on. So effectively, they now had three arms. But it wasn't invasive at all. It was They were learning to operate this arm through the activity of something else. Okay, And that's, in, and that's how it began initially with the, the, the studies, the earliest studies on, on movement were also in, in inserting electrodes into muscles and so on, trying to interpret uh, the activity uh, in, in that way. So there are tremendous... I mean, in, in terms of these... I mean, this fantastic image, we've got a photo in the, in the book of the... Uh, one of the women who's there's a brilliant video on the nature website of her drinking a cup of coffee for the first time in I think it's 15 years of her own volition and this arm comes over and she raises the cup to her lips and not only is she overjoyed you can see the operator the guy who's recording everything I mean he's virtually mm. crying it's incredibly <laughs> moving the power of this is extraordinary but you shouldn't imagine that it's directly tapping into the neural circuit. Similarly, attempts to provide artificial vision are not directly stimulating exactly the same pathways as we use when we see. And that's why the patients have to learn to distinguish things. And eventually they can do that, um, but it's not directly tapping in. I mean, I, I guess what's, what's rather optimistic perhaps about that is it, maybe we don't need the, this explanatory theory Absolutely. Um, to be able to make well, certainly phenomenal not to help advances. people. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, therapeutically. Okay, um, do you think there are any sorts of theories being developed that are kind of possible candidates for, you know, that th- they're going to work out? So, I mean, I know you, you touched on this thing, the, the predictive brain. This is the Bayesian brain, the predictive brain. This is the kind of theory favoured by uh, Anil Seth and uh, Carl Friston um, and Andy Clark, the philosopher. And, and I have heard that touted as a potential unifying theory for new neuroscience. Um, do, do you have any sense that it, that it could be a really fruitful line? Well, as a general approach, I think it's intuitively right. I mean, partly where we know our minds work on Bayesian basis, we don't, you know, and this is the idea that we, we value certain bits of evidence rather than others, depending on our, our priors, what we have previously learned. We're not a blank slate. We've built up this set of information, some of it's genetically encoded. We're more interested, we're more likely to pay attention to some uh, bits of evidence th- than others. So clearly our minds work along that way. I've got no problem in that, that seems to be one of the human aspects of humans and probably of uh, many other animals as well. As to how that's instantiated, how that's represented in nervous systems, that's when you get complicated. So Carl Friston's work, which I'm happy to admit I do not understand at all because it is some pretty heavy maths in there. Um, he argues that he's, his mathematical theory enables a kind of high-level representation of those Bayesian priors in the activity of nervous systems which you can detect in high level waves of neural activity. Now my view about this is well it might be right show me in a maggot. So I think that if this is true then it should be able to be demonstrated in one of the really simple systems that we know an awful lot about Mm. and we're getting back to the lobster's stomach. Or In the case of prediction, one of the analogies that I use is, uh, this is a paper that I remember falling in love with when it came out in 1978. Absolutely brilliant. Some researchers from Sussex in their back garden near Brighton were watching some hoverflies, those little flies that move around in patches of sunlight in your garden. And these are generally males that are kind of occupying a space. And if you squeeze an orange pip between your fingers and flick it through, or even a bit of grot, you throw a bit of dirt through this cloud of hoverflies, they will intercept it. So they, in a, in, you know, in a few hundred milliseconds, have calculated where that, what that object is, how big it is, where it's moving to, and what they need to do to intercept it. I mean, it's an absolutely extraordinary bit of calculation. And it's purely linear. There's no Bayesian a priors in here. It's a prediction of where you're going to be. We don't understand how that works. People have been trying to do this, and now with Drosophila, they've spent an awful lot of time trying to work out on a cellular level how that works, and we still don't understand. That's that's not a complicated bit of maths, I don't think. It's relatively straightforward. Now, if though I'm I'm very happy that you know Friston or anybody else's Bayesian approach is is valid, but I'd like to see it rather than living in the realm of abstraction or even a very high level. Uh, sets of activity in a primate brain or even in a rat brain let's get it down to the cellular level of something we can understand a maggot which has maybe 10,000 neurons we're getting towards a connectome you can change the activity of individual cells in uh, the maggot brain and maggots do some very complicated things calculating what's going on inside their outside their environment and all the rest of it we should be able to study that we should be able to model both model and test the hypothesis, those various uh, theories in simple nervous systems. And that's really, that's where I put my money. I mean, that's that's my job. So clearly I want us to have more money, but I I think that I'm not against all the high level theorization, you know, because it could all come good. But the best way of demonstrating its validity, and I think testing it in its real detail will be to, in, you know, represent it in the activity of simple nervous systems that we understand. Great. Okay. So that's a, that's a very clear sort of injunction of this is where you think progress can be made. That's where you think that it, you yeah, might tractably absolutely. apply some of these neuroscientific techniques. Yeah. Um, what, what are the animals that you study and, and which, is, which is the kind of, um, I mean, I know like Drosophila, you know, the fruit flies and the maggots you mentioned and the different certain kinds of worms have been intensively studied. Where are we with them? How, do do we really understand some of those? I mean, your lobster stomach example makes me think maybe we we just don't 
even even on those very simple uh, models. Well, no, to be blunt, we don't, but we've got a good chance. I mean, so the, the, the two key examples are either C. elegans, the nematode worm, which, I mean, I know they say it has a brain, but it's only got 302 neurons. So whatever <laughs> brain it's got, it's pretty, you know, it's just a few dozen neurons that happen to come together. But that's the beginning of a brain. But we still don't understand. We still can't predict what a, 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 what a, a, a worm is going to do, which way it's going to turn. I study uh, the Drosophila larva, the maggot. And that, as I say, has got about 10,000 neurons in its brain. And um, I, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't even study the brain because that's too complicated. I just study the peripheral, the first layer of processing of the olfactory signal. I'm interested in what those receptor neurons are doing. But um, there are other colleagues who are much cl cleverer than me and have got together in a huge uh, international consortium who for the last decade have been trying to draw up the connectome or wiring diagram of a maggot. The maggot brain project. Yeah, absolutely. The maggot <laughs> brain project. And the art is significant there. It's a single maggot. Okay. They got one maggot, they chopped it up, and then they did transmission electron micrography on it, and they worked out, they are working still, how it's all interconnected. All those 10,000 neurons are, 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 are connected together. And this is, the maggot brain is about the size of an eye, the dot on an eye in a, in a, in a piece of text. It's that small. Mm. You've got 10,000 mm. neurons in there. Uh, maggots can learn. They can remember stuff. Uh, they process visual signals, olfactory signals, uh, taste signals, all, all sorts of things. And the advantage of why that's a good place to start, I think, is that um, in drawing up the wire, wiring diagram, it's not simply a map. It's also a toolbox. So you identify a particular cell because of the genes that are, are active in it. And then you can manipulate those genes because we can do basically anything with Drosophila. So uh, colleagues at um, Genelia Farm, uh, which is this big research station out near Washington, D.C., a couple of whom have now come over to Cambridge. So they're going to be working in the zoology department in Cambridge. Fantastic, extraordinary scientists. Um, uh, Martha Zlatic and uh, Albert Cardona, um, they have been able to predict how something like rolling behavior will happen. So a maggot, if you poke it with a needle, it rolls away because it thinks you're a parasitic wasp coming to lay an egg in it like alien. It doesn't like it. And they've been able to show the neural networks that are involved in that and model them and begin, and they still haven't got to the end of it, but begin to understand how differing states emerge from the pattern of activity of a handful of neurons that detect that it's been poked and then tell it to roll away. And that very simple kind of behavior, I think if we can understand that, like the lobster's stomach, then there are going to be principles emerging from that, I assume, that we can then scale up, just like there were in understanding the human genome. We didn't start with the human genome. We started with very simple genomes, and then we, we developed the techniques for understanding how genomes are organized and for doing the technical work using much simpler systems. And I think the same thing if, you know, if I was in charge of all the world's money, apart from pouring it all into COVID-19 research and developing an antibody test, I would be, uh, that's the obvious thing, but that's going to be done in a year and a half, you know. Then we can move on to the serious stuff, which is trying to understand how small nervous systems produce the astonishing behavior they do. Well, there you are. I mean, I, uh, I can see why you're so suspicious of the Human Brain Project, given that we still don't quite know how the, the maggot, brain, <laughs> maggot brain is functioning. My guess would be if we understand the maggot brain in 50 years, um, I, we know everything it does and we can model that on a computer and we know exactly how changing the activity of those different cells is going to produce a different output. I would be amazed. Wow. Even 50 years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, slow work. Well, there you go. I think that that's that's a wake up call. <laughs> Maggot scientists get to work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, I say in the book that this isn't intended to, to depress anybody. I mean, rather by saying what, you know, the four most important words in science are we do not know. Right. Mm. So by admitting that and focusing on what we don't know and thinking about how we could find the answer, then I think that does and it is a wake-up call in that sense, in that it's, it's saying, right, how should we best be focusing our resources in the coming decade or so? Great. Well, there you are. Sort of slightly depressing, but also, <laughs> also thrilling. Well, I hope so. I hope it, yeah, thrilling is what it's supposed to be. But perhaps to finish on a positive note, we, we, can, <laughs> we can just think back to the incredible advances 
made with, um, you know, helping paralyzed people to control uh, robotic yeah. limbs, the, the kind of treatments for Parkinson's, the deep brain stimulation. So we need a theory, but even without a theory, we can still achieve some great things, even if by accident. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's what most of medicine yeah. is. <laughs> well, with that thought, Professor Matthew Cobb, thank you for speaking with me. You're very welcome. It's been great. Thank you.